All right, lessons from Naaman the leper. Naaman the leper. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with this story, but I wanted to, like I did with Jonah last week, just draw some lessons from the story that you may not have realized, even though you may be familiar with the story. If you're not, we'll go through it uh, as we go through the story and you'll see uh, what actually happened here and how uh, this story, it's quite obvious that uh, Naaman washing himself and being clean of leprosy, it's a picture of salvation. So I want you to see um, how this story applies to salvation throughout this story in 2 Kings chapter 5. <clears throat> now before we get into 2 Kings chapter 5, this story in 2 Kings chapter 5 of Naaman the Syrian is actually alluded to by Jesus in Luke chapter 4 and in another gospel as well. But I want to show you here what he talks about in Luke chapter 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, <clears throat> and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. <clears throat> and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the, of the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah is Isaiah the prophet. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. So what is he saying? Like He's actually referring to himself, that this, this, this scripture that he just read in Isaiah, is he is here to fulfill this scripture. And all bear him witness, and wondered, right? They're amazed or shocked <coughs> at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. So this is not that they actually received graciously what he was saying out of his mouth. It's just that they were one, they wondered that he, the things that he was saying graciously. That is what it's saying there. Because as you read on, you'll see that they did not accept what he had to say, which proceeded out of his mouth, <coughs> and they said. Is not this Joseph's son? Right? So you see how he's saying, hey, I'm going to fulfill this scripture. And they're already starting to doubt. Like, we know this person. Isn't this the carpenter's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. So he's saying, you, you will see that I will do these things and you'll say one day that the things that you've heard me do in other places, we want it done here, but it won't be done there. And it's interesting that after this passage that we're just about to read, Jesus actually goes into Capernaum and does all sorts of miracles and heals people and whatnot. So he's saying to them, you know, you'll surely say that you want what you'll hear me to do here, but it won't happen. And he said, verily I say unto you, <clears throat> no prophet is accepted in his own country. So you see how he's saying to them who are of his own town, right, because he was called a Nazarene because he grew up in Nazareth, that they are going to reject him even though he is the fulfillment of that prophecy in Isaiah. No prophet is accepted in his own country. So you can see that even Jesus was not accepted amongst his own closest kin, right, where he grew up. But I tell you of a truth, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias. So Elias is Elijah, right? When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. So you can see here that even in the days of Elijah, so he's comparing the fact that in the days of Elijah and Elisha, not many miracles were done amongst, you know, the nation of Israel, amongst those people because of their unbelief. So even here in Elijah's day, saying, hey, not many were helped during this famine except this <coughs> lady Sarepta, a woman that was a widow. And here's where he mentions Naaman. And many lepers <coughs> were in Israel in the time of 
Elisaias. So Elis Elisaias is Elisha in the New Testament, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. So you notice that in the days of Elijah, it wasn't just Elijah was just healing lepers here and there. This is why when Jesus came and did a lot of miracles, why were people so amazed that he was just healing people and all these miracles were happening? Because it didn't normally happen. Right? Even in the days of Elijah and Elisha, we're reading through the miracles that they're doing, but they're not happening that often. And even here, that there was a leper cleanse, but Jesus is saying here, none of them were cleansed. There was many lepers in those days, but Elisha didn't cleanse all of them. There was one cleanse, Naaman the Syrian. So it wasn't even an Israelite. Why? Because they often had rejected the man of God in those days. Just like in Elijah's day where they were all worshipping Baal and then he had to have that thing on uh, Mount Carmel. Elisha as well was not accepted and rejected in many things that he did for the nation of Israel. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. So you see how not only are they not accepting what Jesus is saying about himself, but the fact that he's telling them that you are going to reject me, just like the nation of Israel rejected Elisha and, and Elijah, and uh, not many miracles were done in that place. They were getting angry at the things he's saying. And rose up <coughs> and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they might cast him down headlong. So they're getting so angry that they want to murder Jesus right now. So you can imagine the commotion that's going on. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. Went his way. <clears throat> so somehow he snuck out of the crowd. I mean, whether just normally or supernaturally, we don't know. So that is where Naaman the leper, or Naaman the Syrian, is mentioned in the New Testament. And this is the story that he's referring to in 2 Kings chapter 5. So let's go through the story and I'll just point out a couple of things as we go. <laughs> now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him, look at this, the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. So you see here how like they are sort of under tribute of the Syrians. <coughs> <coughs> But you can see it was actually of the Lord that the Syrians had taken Israel captive at this time. Because by him. So it was Naaman leading the army in this day when they took Israel captive. Because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Now remember as we read through this story, <clears throat> There's a lot of similarities <coughs> in this story between what's going on with Naaman the Syrian, right? Also known as Naaman the leper, and salvation. And what I want you to think on here is, see, Naaman was a great man. He was honorable. He was a mighty man of valor. He was the captain of the hosts of the king of Syria, right? He was the captain. He was like a general of the army but he was a leper. And what I want to show you here is, it doesn't matter how great people are in this world, it doesn't matter how much honor they have, it doesn't matter how successful they are in this world, everyone has sin. Everybody is a sinner. And some people, you know, when you talk to them out and about, they, they think, oh no, no, surely there are people out there that have done things in this life that would merit them getting to heaven. You know, they say, oh, you know, some people need a saviour, but some people, what about the people that do good in their life? You know, like the Mother Teresa. And, you know, Mother Teresa always comes up as the example. It's like, what about Mother Teresa? Like, people that do all these good or uh, all these other charitable people. And what you want to see here, it doesn't matter how great Naaman was, how honourable he was, how mighty he was in the eyes of men. We see here that he was a leper. He had sinned, just like people in this world. doesn't matter how great you are. You have sin in this world. There is none good but one that is God. This is what Jesus said. Look what it says here in Mark 10, 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So there's obviously more to this story than just this passage I'm 
bringing out. But you see this rich young ruler comes to Jesus and it still has the mindset that he can do something. He can do some good work in order to go to heaven, right? <coughs> and Jesus is even trying to reveal to him that he is a sinner. But look at how Jesus responds. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. So isn't that the truth? There is none good. We read in Romans 3 as well, there is none that doeth good. There is none that seeketh after, after, after God. But here, is Jesus good? Yeah, people would say Jesus is good, then Jesus must be God. Right? So one passage that you can go to to prove that Jesus is God, well, is Jesus good? Because Jesus says there is none good but one that is God. If Jesus is good, then Jesus is God, right? Because he's sinless. Otherwise, he's got sin like anybody else, and then he can't be our saviour. 1 John 1, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So anybody that thinks they have no sin, people that believe they can get to a point of sinless perfection, what does the Bible say? Hey, we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. That's one thing we have to admit in order to be saved, that we are sinners. And you know what? If somebody doesn't believe they're a sinner, doesn't acknowledge the punishment for their sin, why would they believe on the Saviour? So sometimes people, um, you know, will accuse us and say, oh, you know, you don't just believe in Jesus. You've got to acknowledge you're a sinner. Well, of course you have to acknowledge you're a sinner. You have to know that your sin is deserving of hell. Otherwise, why would you even want to believe on Jesus? Why would you even want to receive a Saviour? Right, but you don't have to turn from your sins to be saved. You don't have to be willing to give up those sins to be saved. That's something, that's a lifelong mission once you are saved in order to grow in the faith. All right, verse 2. So we can see here, it doesn't matter how great you are, everybody has sinned. Everybody is a sinner. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And I just thought it's interesting here that she's mentioned as a little maid. I don't know if it's necessarily just pointing out her stature. You know, maybe she was a, a short person or a small person. But <clears throat> what I want you to think on here is even somebody small can make a big difference. Right? And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, so this is to Naaman's wife, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord. So you can see that it's not Naaman's wife that went in. It's just somebody that's hearing the conversation between the little Israelite lady and Naaman's wife and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. <clears throat> so he's telling Naaman here that there is a prophet in Samaria, right? Samaria that can heal him. He's, and then she's referring, of course, to Elisha, right? Now, what I want you to think of in this verses right here is the, if, if would Naaman, you, you see, you read this passage and you think, man, Elisha was the great soul winner here, you know, healing Naaman, telling him to go wash and be clean, you know, and you know, being sent to Elisha the prophet. But I think this little maid from Israel, this is the soul winner in the story, right? It's not Elisha. It's the maid that pointed Naaman to Elisha. But notice that she didn't even point Naaman. She didn't even get to talk to Naaman, just mentioning the, the man in Israel that can help Naaman the leper to <coughs> her mistress was overheard by somebody else. That word then got to Naaman and Naaman got cleansed. So what I want you to think about here is we want to speak up. You never know who you are going to affect when you share the gospel with people. Right? So she heard about Naaman's problem. Notice that. And then she told her mistress, Naaman's wife, and then the word spread to somebody who ended up benefiting from that. But let me ask you, what if this little maid from Israel said nothing? What if she knew that somebody had this problem and she didn't speak up at all? She didn't even tell her mistress. 
Maybe Naaman wouldn't have got cleansed. Naaman wouldn't have known to go to Elisha in Israel and get cleansed. So what is the analogy here when it comes to us and comes to the gospel? You never know who you're going to impact when you talk to people about Jesus Christ. You know, maybe that person doesn't get saved, but you never know how it on flows to other people. This is why we have to speak up. We have to be bold in our witness. You never know who you are going to affect. So, I mean, just think about your own life. I'm sure when you think about your own life, I mean, I even think about my own life and different people that have had an impact on me along the way. And, you know, you always wonder how word spreads and how it eventually got to you. So it's the same with Naaman, the Syrian here. So if the little maid didn't say anything, would Naaman have got saved? She's the sole winner in this story. This is why I think it's great, this, this little maid, that she's even mentioned little, that even the smallest of us can make a huge difference to the point where even the general of this army is now worshipping the Lord God of Israel, as we saw in the end of this passage. So we always want to be ready. What's going to give you boldness to share your faith? You need to be ready. Right? If you're not ready, when the opportunity comes, it's going to pass you by. 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. With meekness and fear. Now, how do you get ready always to give an answer to every man that <coughs> asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear? Now, if you're just learning, 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 that's only half of the equation. Right? You learn, you learn, you learn, you know the answers. But you know what? If you, never, if you aren't in the habit of having those conversations, you know when that conversation comes up, you know what's going to happen? You're going to hesitate. Why? Because you aren't in the habit of talking to people about the gospel. And this is why soul winning is so important, that you go regularly, that you preach the gospel to people. Because you know, when it just becomes second nature, and you just know how to talk about it, and when objections come up or topics come up, you can just talk about it. Why? Because you've always been talking about it. It's just part of who you are. It's part of how you live. You don't choke when you get the opportunity. Oh, I don't know the answer. Oh, you hesitate, right? But if you know what you're talking about, and then you're in the habit of talking about it, you know what? You'll be more ready when you get the opportunity to talk about it. And we've all been there. We've all been there when we've had that opportunity to bring it up and we hesitated. But you know what? You'll hesitate less the more ready you are. And how do you get ready? You've got to learn and you've got to do. Right? Because if you don't do, you won't even be in the habit of doing it when you get that opportunity. So be ready. You need to be in the habit of talking about it so when that opportunity comes, you take it. All right, verse 5. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, <coughs> and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. So he's going to get healed and he's expecting that it's going to cost him a lot. So he comes prepared to pay a lot of money. <coughs> and that's what people think about salvation, don't they? When they think about salvation, they think it's going to cost them a lot. Well, something, sometimes people hesitate in order to get saved because they think it's going to take a huge drastic change in their life. I mean, how many times have people said to me, oh, I'm just not ready to get saved once I get my life together and think, ready to make that commitment. See, a lot of people think that salvation takes this huge change, this huge commitment, but it doesn't. It's free. This is what Naaman thought. Naaman thought he was going to go to Elisha. He's ready to like give up a lot in order to be cleansed. And we'll see later on that it didn't cost him anything, that Elisha actually refused to take any of this. But this is what people think. You know, your salvation doesn't cost you anything. But this is where people get it confused with discipleship. Because you know what? Discipleship will cost you everything. Right? Because to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you'll have to give it all. Right? Give your life to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. But that's not what it takes to be saved. Salvation is free. Salvation costs you nothing. Salvation is a gift. Right? So salvation won't cost you anything, but discipleship will cost you everything. All right, let's go on. Verse 6, And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, <coughs> saying, so this is now Naaman, 
going to Israel, and he's got a letter from his king, the king of Syria, to the king of Israel, basically asking on behalf of Naaman, heal this, heal my servant, because he's assuming, oh, there's a man of God in, <laughs> isn't it funny, there's a man of God in Israel, the king of Syria assumes that everyone respects the man of God in Israel, <laughs> right? But like we read about with Jesus, people don't respect the familiarity and coming from that country, they don't respect the person that they have within their midst. <laughs> now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, <coughs> I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he ran his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make a lie that this man doth sent unto me? to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. So what's going on here? He's saying, like, is this like a joke? Is this guy just trying to pick a fight with me to ask me to do something that he knows I'm not capable of? And when I say I can't do this, that's going to be reason to, like, have a war with me? That's what the king of Israel is saying here. He's saying, am I God to make a lie of this man? He's like, he's asking me to do something that's impossible for me. And he says, wherefore, consider, I pray you, that see how he seeketh seek a quarrel against me. He's trying to pick a fight. And the thought I had from this king's reaction, I know it's not exactly the same, but the, the thought I had when the king reacted to this way of this petition is <clears throat> sometimes people's initial reaction to the gospel is disbelief that it can be this easy. Right? <laughs> so, that's just the thought I had when this king's response, when, he's, when somebody's asking to be saved, that it's just, well, this is something, how is this even possible, right? And sometimes people, they react when they hear the gospel, they're in a bit of disbelief that it's so easy, right? And people often ask the question, how can salvation be that easy? And you know, often when I'm preaching the gospel to somebody and they say that to me, it's like, oh, it sounds too easy, Often I'll say to them, well, that means you're starting to understand salvation. Because if you're getting the thought, hey, this is really easy to be saved, then you're understanding salvation because salvation is easy to get saved. We don't do the hard part. Jesus did the hard part for us. He made it easy for us because it's by the grace of God. I look in John 4. John 4, 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, "Whosoever," this is the story of the woman at the well, whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 6, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. And lastly, in John 10, Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the, the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. You know, when I used to go soul winning in Arizona, my friend uh, Matthew Stuckey, when he used to go soul winning, he would always say to people, they would say, oh, it just sounds so easy. He would always say, well, salvation is easy. Salvation is as easy, he would say, as drinking a glass of water. Salvation is as easy as, you know, eating a piece of bread. Salvation is as easy as walking through a door. And isn't that the truth? Salvation is easy. You know, this is why sometimes when people say, how can salvation be so easy? Well, salvation is easy because Jesus did the hard part. Jesus lived the perfect life. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus descended into hell. Jesus rose again, right? Jesus did the hard part so that you could be saved. That's why it's a gift. Now, as we serve him, that is the hard part. And this is where people get those things mixed up between what it takes to be saved and what it takes to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You don't need to be a disciple to get saved, right? Salvation is a free gift, and it's easy. Now, 2 Kings chapter 5, it says, It was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard <laughs> that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So we see here Elisha's confidence, where he's saying, why is the king so worried? Send him to me, 
and he will know that there's a prophet in Israel, that there is the true God of Israel. So what it made me think of here is <coughs> those of us who are saved, those of us who understand salvation, we can have confidence in the truth that we possess. You know, how often when you try and share the gospel with somebody, you say, hey, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? And they say, like, oh, are you sure that you're going to heaven? Because they think it's based on works. They think it's based on you. But when you share, you can share with confidence because it's not based on you, right? It's based on Jesus Christ. That's why you don't have to be perfect to go soul winning, right? Often soul winning is what helps you to grow. You know, as you try and bear fruit, Jesus will purge it, that it will bring forth more fruit. You know, going soul winning and preaching the gospel, teaching is the greatest way to learn in the Christian life and the greatest way to grow. Right? So you don't have to be perfect to go. And that's good because it's not based on you. See, if salvation was based on your change, your works, that's when people get into the mindset, ah, oh, you know, I'm not living right. It's, why am I telling people about committing their life to Jesus? I'm not committing my life to Jesus. Because you believe in work salvation. Right? If you don't believe work salvation, you realize, well, it's all Jesus. You know, when you go soul winning and you realize your own wretchedness, you realize you don't deserve salvation, man, when you preach the gospel to somebody else, it just reinforces God's love for you. It reinforces that you don't deserve salvation either, as much as this person that you're preaching it to. And then when you tell them about God's love, this is one way it reminds you of your own wretchedness, right? And your own need of salvation and how gracious God was to us to give us salvation. Right? Totally different experience when you believe work salvation or you believe salvation by grace, you believe the truth. 2 Kings 5, uh, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. I think this is interesting what Elisha does here. I don't know if you caught it when we were reading it. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. So notice that he comes all the way to Elisha's house. Elisha doesn't even come down to meet him. Elisha just sends somebody to go tell him what to do. <laughs> right? Now obviously Naaman, general. Right? Can you imagine? General comes, he comes to your house to pay you a visit, and you don't even go to the front door to, say, to talk to him. Right? You send somebody else to go tell him what to do. Now you can understand why Naaman is upset. <coughs> But Naaman was wroth, angry, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. <laughs> so you can see a couple of things here, right? What is Naaman expecting? Naaman expecting this experience. He's expecting like a Pentecostal experience. He's expecting Benny Hinn to come <laughs> and meet him at the door, you know, swing his jacket and strike his hand, Ew! you know, that sort of stuff. He's expecting something, you know, really uh, illustrious and really grand. But no, he just sends his servant out, tells him to go and uh, wash in the river. Now the thought I had here when uh, Naaman was getting upset is... People have so little respect for the things of God that they think the things of this world are lifted up higher than the things of God. I mean, even us as Christians, don't we honour those in the world sometimes more than we even honour those in the faith? Whereas Paul, when he talked about who to honour, it was those that were serving the Lord Jesus Christ, those that had given up a lot for the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the people that we should lift up and those are the people that we should honour, not just the people that have been successful in this world, like Naaman. Like Naaman thought he should have been lifted up and at least be paid a visit by Elisha, the man of God. But I think here Elisha was trying to humble him, right? And didn't even go and see him. You know what this reminds me of? <clears throat> Naaman's uh, reaction, where he says, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me. When unbelievers say things like, You know, if God wants me to believe, he can just reveal himself to me, show me that he believes, if he really wants me to get saved. You know, that's the prideful attitude of the unbeliever, like Naaman, to think that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, owes you a visit just for you to trust <laughs> what he says. I think not, and I think, like, same with Elisha, you know, it's just like, even though he could have come down to talk to Naaman, no, God sends 
preachers. God sends messengers. You know, and if, if the messenger sent to Naaman was not good enough for Naaman, then Naaman wouldn't have got healed. And it's like us today. God sends us, his messengers, to go preach the gospel. People have to believe that. You remember the story, man, that reminds me, I didn't even have it in my notes, but remember uh, the story in uh, uh, Luke 16 of the rich man in hell. And he's asking, hey, send somebody to go tell them about this place. And he said, if they believe not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one was sent unto them, right? Though one rose from the dead. And one did rise from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. But you see here, the pe people have a prideful attitude, right? That God, he said, God wanted me to believe he could just reveal himself to me. <clears throat> Look at what it says in John 20, verse 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. You see, if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, even not seeing, we will be more blessed than those that saw him. All right, let's continue. 2 Kings 5. Oh, before I go on, just, there's just a couple of other things I just wanted to mention, actually. Here in uh, verse 11. <laughs> you see here as well that when Naaman went to Elisha, and Elisha said, well, just go wash in the river. You see how Naaman had a different expectation? See, Naaman thought he would come out he would say, oh, in the name of Jehovah, in the name of Jesus, and strike his hand over. So some people, they have a certain expectation when it comes to getting saved, right? They think it's going to be some emotional experience. They think it's going to be some, maybe some supernatural experience. So people have different expectations in order to get saved. They don't think it might just be something as mundane as going into the dirty rivers of Jordan and just washing seven times and becoming clean. So some people have wrong expectations, right? Whether it's something very supernatural or emotional, um, uh, you know, some people expect, you know, even God's prompting, you know, when it comes to just spiritual things. They think like everything has to be like, oh, God moving me, God speaking to me, I have to get a vision. They don't always think it's just something as simple as, well, just read your Bible, that's God's word, that's God's living word, and God will speak to you through his word. There's, all the instruction is there, right? See, God knows from beginning to end. I'm sure he can write a book that addresses everything you need to know, no matter what's going to happen in your future, right? So it's the same with Naaman here. Naaman had different expectations, but sometimes they're the wrong expectations, right? And God doesn't always operate in the way we expect, now look at what he says here in 2 Kings 5. Are not Abana and Farpa, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. So he's saying like, well, if I just had to go into a river and wet myself, can I, couldn't I just do that back in Syria? Don't we have Abana and Farpa, our own rivers? I can just go there and be clean if I just needed to take a bath, right? And notice here, one thing I think of here is how salvation is exclusive in Jesus Christ. See, some people think, see, some people when they think of salvation, they think, well, what does it matter? All religions are the same. You know, if I just have to clean up my life and you know, go to church and do unto others as I would have done unto you. See, people are thinking of the physical. They're thinking of like how to just better themselves by works, right? Like Naaman was thinking here. He wasn't thinking of the spiritual. Right? He was thinking, well, if I just wash myself, just the physical. Right? So it's the same with salvation. Salvation is exclusive. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. Sometimes people have this mindset, well, salvation through Jesus Christ is just one way to heaven. But no, salvation through Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And a lot of Hindus and Buddhists have this mentality, don't they? When they think, oh, well, all roads lead to Rome. You know, if you believe that that's your way to heaven that'll work for you. If that's their way to heaven, that'll work for them. But no, just like we see in this story here, that he had to go into the Jordan River to wash himself, right? There was a specific, there was only one way for him to be washed and to be clean. But he thought, well, aren't they all the same? No, they're not all the same, right? Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God in the flesh. Salvation is only through him. Look here in John 14, verse 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father 
but by me. This is always a good one to memorize, right? John 14, 6, that if people think, well, all roads lead to Rome, all roads lead to heaven. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught that he was the only way unto the Father. <coughs> Look at Acts 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So you see how Jesus is the only way to heaven. Don't ever get caught up in these ideas that, hey, this is just one way. Hey, this is the way that Christians get to heaven, but that's not the other way. Muslims get to heaven. Muslims go their own way. No. Anybody that rejects the Lord Jesus Christ will not be saved. Right? So it's not about what church you're a part of. Right? It's not about what you call yourself. It's about how to be saved. Right? So salvation can only come through Jesus because Jesus is the only way that sins can be forgiven. That's why Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Now look here. 2 Kings 5. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? So his servants try and talk some sense into him and just say, look, if the prophet had asked you to do something really extravagant, right? Like to go on some pilgrimage or do some sort of crazy thing. Maybe we're blowing out hot air. He says, wouldn't you have done it? But how much rather than when he asks you to do something simple, then you can wash and be clean. And what I think here is, you know, some people in the world, like unbelievers, are willing to do all sorts of crazy, crazy things to be saved, aren't they? I mean, some people will beat themselves. I don't know if you know that. It's like self-flagellation. They're just like whipping themselves and just like walking on these things. Like some people are willing to beat themselves. Some people are willing to just tra like travel on a pilgrimage to the other side of the world and visit all these holy sites, kiss the big stone or kiss, kiss the big statue. They're willing to do that to be saved. Some people will deny themselves of basic pleasures. You know, I think of the Buddhists or the you know, Catholic monks that live in monasteries and you know, uh, live an abstinent lifestyle. You know, they don't get married and they won't eat certain things and they live this lifestyle. They, they shave all their hair off. They can't touch certain things. They're willing to do all these things in order to be saved, but they won't just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, you know, people that we know are not that crazy, but then how many people have you spoken to will say, oh, but surely you've got to do something. Surely you've got to go to church and change your life and do this and do that in order to be saved. You know, not just everybody can go to heaven just by believing on Jesus Christ. And it reminds me of Naaman here. It's like, it's like okay, well, if somebody told you, okay, you've got to go to church every week and you've got to get baptized and you've got to do this, it's like you're more, people are more willing to do that because they feel like they're earning salvation than to just say, Jesus has done it all. Just wash and be clean. Right? So salvation is, uh, is free. And some people, they want it to be hard. Right? They expect it to be hard when it's not. It's as easy as just getting into the river. Then he went down <coughs> and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So notice here, you can see the different soul winners that are happening in this story. And I just had this thought now that, you remember the maid was, the, was how Naaman heard about how to be saved. But you see, even when he went to Elisha and he heard again from the messenger that came to the door, hey, go and wash in the river, he didn't humble himself to just do it. But you see, like, if the servant didn't say anything, would Naaman have been saved? So this is where you've got to understand our part to play in salvation that there's always an opportunity to change somebody's mind. So you know how people always wonder, like, well, what's the purpose of us going out if they already have an opportunity to be saved? Well, because we can change their mind. Just like the servant, if he didn't just say something and just say, look, all you have to do is just wash and be clean. Right? It was because of him as well that Naaman ended up getting his, lepr his leprosy cleansed. Right? So we have to make sure we speak up. We don't know 
what difference we're going to make. <laughs> so he goes there, washes himself in Jordan River seven times like he was asked. So he had to humble himself to say, well, I'll just do it. And he returned. So now he's healed. His flesh came again like under the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. He returned to the man of God. All right, so now he's glad. He realizes that he's been cleansed. He and all his company came and stood before him and said, behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. It's the same when we get saved. We get that assurance that we know. See, people often wonder, like, how do you know that you're saved? Well, you believe on Jesus Christ. You can know. You can have that assurance. And those that believe, we know that we're going to heaven. We don't doubt because we know God is not a liar. Verse 16. This is Elisha's response to him offering him possessions in, in, in uh, gratitude for what has happened to him. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So notice here, now that he's humbled himself and washed in the river, which you think represents salvation, isn't it interesting that now Elisha is talking with him? Right? So he didn't talk to him when he wanted and he was coming to get saved with the wrong attitude and he sent his messenger now, you know, that in this story he's like saved, he's been cleansed. Now he's talking directly with Elisha. Isn't this interesting? Because obviously Elisha is, uh, in this analogy, is God in this instance, right? He's representing God, but God is giving this gift. He's cleansing us of our sin. He urged him to take it, but he refused. So what I want you to think about here is that oftentimes people know that salvation is free, know that it doesn't cost them anything, but they still insist, no, I must do something in order for this. And what you want to understand here is if people insist to pay for their salvation, even though they appreciate that Jesus has paid for it all, God is not going to let you. Just like here, even though he wanted to give something for his cleansing, Elisha refused it. And it's the same with salvation. If people try to contribute to their salvation, God will not receive it, and, and, and they won't be so. You can't mix grace and works. Why? Because salvation is a gift. Let's read through a few common verses here. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So notice it's a gift. If it's a gift, then it's not by works. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. So you see, because salvation is a gift from God, you can't earn it. You can't try and pay for it. God's not going to let you pay for it. But why? Because it's a gift from God. And once he lets you pay for that gift, it's no longer a gift. And this is why salvation can't be a mix of the two. Some people get this idea that, well, Jesus does 99%, and then I just got to do my part. Once you do that 1%, it's no longer a gift. Right? You can't mix Grace and works. Look at this verse in Romans 11, verse 6. <coughs> and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. You see how you can't mix the two? Once you put a little bit of works into grace, it's all works now. Right? So grace has to be completely free. If you have to do a little bit of work, now it's all by work. They're the two options. Right? And this is why in Galatians 5, Paul writes here, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why is he saying that? Because there were people in the Galatian church that thought they had to be circumcised in order to be saved. And if they had to be circumcised to be saved, he says, you know what? If you think you have to do something to be saved, Jesus Christ will profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. What's the point he making? What is the point he's making here? That if you think you have to do one commandment in order to be saved, you know what? You have to keep all the commandments to be saved. Right? Because it's either a gift or it's by works. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. Second Kings 5. Let's go back. Verse 17. Naaman said, Shall there not then, I pray thee, be given to thy servant two, two mules, burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offering nor sacrifice unto other gods, 
but unto the Lord. I think what's happening here is, is he wants to take some land of Israel back so that he can worship like kind of in Israel, back in Syria. I think that's what he's asking for here. But in this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimmon, so this is a false god of Syria, to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself <coughs> in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. So you can see that he kind of, on his conscience, knows that he shouldn't be, do- he knows that he shouldn't be doing this. But it's interesting the way Elisha responds. He says, and he said unto him, go in peace. Right, so Elisha didn't think there was any issue with this, right? So he departed from him a little way. So what's going on here? So Naaman is saying, I'm going to worship the Lord God. But sometimes I help the king of Syria go and worship his false god. This is something I'm required to do. And when he leans on me, I'm helping him bow, right? So I'm going to be, in a sense, bowing in the house of Rimmon. He's saying, "Can pardon me for doing this. So... It's interesting that Elisha doesn't rebuke him for this, doesn't say that he shouldn't do this, right? He says, go in peace. So you can see here that idolatry is really a matter of the heart, isn't it? So even though he's in that place, and people might be thinking, well, is he he bowing down to Rimmon? But, you know, he was required of the king to help him perform some of these duties, some of the things that the king wanted to do. So all I'm saying here is sometimes you can see here that idolatry is a matter of the heart, isn't it? It's not just necessarily the act of bowing, right? Even in the Bible, people bow down to people out of respect. It's not just the issue of being in a certain location. It's not just an issue of having statues, right? It's a heart of whether you're actually worshipping that thing. Now, why, though, would we recommend, you know, not taking part in things like this? Obviously, you know, why would you not want to be associated with these things? Well, because that's the reason why. You don't want to be associated with these things. You don't want to be seen doing this. You don't want people to think that this sort of stuff is okay. But we can see here that there are instances where it may be required of somebody to, to be in a location, to, to help somebody do something that is not necessarily right. right? But, you know, I think, uh, like I said, idolatry is of the heart. Right? So I can imagine, you know, maybe uh, you, know, you work in, I'm just thinking of examples off the top of my head, maybe you work in an old folks home, right? And you're required to help people. And, and you're required to help somebody, like, you know, put things on, you know, help them put their oranges on their statue or whatever. You might be required to help them do that. And I don't think that's necessarily you, you know, acknowledging that idol, but you're just required of your job to help them do things like that. Um, just an example I'm thinking of. <clears throat> Go in peace. Now we th- read about Gehazi. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master had spared Naaman, this Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. So we can see here Gehazi's covetousness leads him to want to try and get something from Naaman when Elijah, Elisha had refused for, I'm sure, a specific purpose of having this picture of salvation, that it was free, that it didn't cost him anything, and that even if he tried to pay for it, it was refused. Verse 21, so Gehazi followed after Naaman and, went Na- and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him and said, is all well? So you see, Gehazi is running after Naaman before he leaves and Na- Naaman sees him running, so he gets off his horse, <coughs> off his chariot to talk to him. And he said, is everything okay? He's thinking something is wrong. And he said, all is well. My master hath sent me. So here now Gehazi is bearing false witness, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So now he's making up this story that, Oh, well, you know what? After you left, we had these two visitors and we wanted to give them some clothes and give them some things. So that's why we're coming to ask for things. I pray thee, two, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So you can see he's just asking for one talent of silver, two pieces of clothing. And Naaman said, be content, take two talents. So Naaman's thinking, well, this is nothing. If you want talents of silver, just take two of them. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags. So he's saying, take it, take it, please. This is nothing. Take two talents of silver, take two changes of garments. And he laid them upon two of his servants. And they bear them before him. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hands. So basically Naaman sends his servants to say, you know what, they're going to carry it for you to the tower. So 
Gehazi's going with them. He gets to the tower, then he takes them off him before he goes in. And he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? So now he's caught, right? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. He says, oh, I didn't go anywhere. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee? It always shocks me that, I mean, surely Gehazi knows Elisha has supernatural powers, right? <laughs> you know, he speaks to God. He just saw Naaman get cleansed, just in the way he prophesies and things like that. But yet, sometimes when you're in sin, again, you're not thinking rationally. You're not thinking about what God is capable of, that God is with you, that God's going to see what you're doing, right? And he said unto him, Went not my heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Right, so he already knew what was happening when Naaman got off his chariot to meet Gehazi. Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and oliveyards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. So we see here what happened, Gehazi's covetousness, he ended up getting cursed with Naaman's leprosy, not only himself, but the generations after it. And you want to see here, he says here, is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and all of his dominions and whatnot? Why? Because it's not wrong in and of itself to receive gifts from others. But you can see here that there was a point of salvation, that salvation was free, that he could wash in the river Jordan, wash and be clean and Elijah, in, you know, in God's place, was refusing any payment for this cleansing. So we can see here, is it a time to receive money? So you see, there is a time for good works. There is a time for serving God. That's the rest of your life after salvation. But is the time for doing works prior to salvation? Is the time to get baptized for salvation prior to salvation? Is the time to try and turn over a new leaf and give your life to Jesus and do all this work prior to salvation? No. That's why there's a time for works. Works comes after salvation, right? In response to salvation, in appreciation of salvation, right? But the picture here is the gospel, right? And Elisha was trying to make the point that this cleansing of his leprosy, of spiritually his sin, right? Spiritually, the analogy here, it is not a time to be doing good works. It's free. And the other thing from this passage is anyone, what we can see here with Gehazi, is anyone that would teach that salvation requires works. We can see here they receive a greater condemnation Right? So the analogy of salvation. So we see here Elisha teaching free salvation, but Gehazi trying to creep works into salvation, and he received an even greater condemnation than, I guess, the, the punishment alone. Right? <coughs> These are the last passages I want to show you. Matthew 23. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. You know, as people often wonder, are there differing degrees of punishment in hell? I believe there are, right? Because otherwise, how can you have a greater damnation for people who had led people astray with salvation, other than people that are just unsaved. So you see, people are unsaved, they will end up in hell. But the people that lead people astray to teach work salvation, right, they will receive a greater damnation. Second Peter 2, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift Destruction. So that's the thought I had when Naaman's leprosy cleaved unto Gehazi and was with him for his generations. Leprosy. So that's like the, the damnation sometimes that happens with false prophets and also the effects that it can have onto future generations. 
All right, so I hope that story was interesting for you. Naaman the Syrian, and uh, I don't know if you were familiar with that story. I think it's very obvious that it's a story about salvation, but I think you can draw a lot of parallels there and lessons about salvation and lessons about soul winning. So just in conclusion, just a few closing thoughts. So no matter how successful you are in this world, everyone needs to get saved. Right? No matter how righteous people think they are, the Bible says all oh, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all need to get saved. But also with the little maid from Israel, right? And even the servant of uh, you know being sent, that was the you know the servant being sent to the door, and then Naaman's servant saying, Hey, look, if he'd asked you to do something great, how much more if he just tells you to wash and be clean? Where these are the soul winning influences, you know, in Naaman's life. Right, so we want to be that soul winner. We want to help people change their mind. We want to introduce them to the gospel. We never know the difference that we're going to make to help somebody get saved. And like Naaman had to wash in the River Jordan, he couldn't just go to the rivers in Syria. There is one way to get saved. That's through Jesus Christ alone. And the last thing we looked at kind of in that chapter is that salvation is a gift. You can't add works to salvation. And this is why Elisha rejected, you know, Naaman being able to pay for that cleansing and then Gehazi was cursed by receiving that, uh, those gifts. All right, so I hope you learned something today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you uh, for the story of Naaman the Syrian, Naaman the leper. And uh, Lord, we just uh, pray, Lord, that uh, we'll be like the little maid that uh, pointed people to the man of God, pointed people to the Lord Jesus Christ and will be like the servant of Naaman, and Lord, helping to change people's minds. Their minds may not be fully made up, but we might be able to persuade them, Lord. Help us to persuade people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that salvation is a free gift, and we thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, you're gracious enough to provide salvation for us. I pray, Lord, that would help others to believe on you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.